North Korea is the only country in the world today where it's illegal for any citizen living there to leave without receiving prior permission from the state. Doing so is legally considered to be treason by the North Korean government. And if you attempt to do so and are caught, you may be punished with a lengthy prison sentence in a hard labor camp or even sentenced to execution. Even moving about within North Korea's territory is difficult and strictly regulated by the state, as you need official documentation and permits just to legally move from one internal province of the country to another. North Korea is almost universally regarded by just about every organization in the world to have the worst human rights record on the planet, with no contemporary parallel. All men in the country are forced into serving a minimum of 10 years in the North Korean army. Free speech is non-existent, and the only media providers are all owned by the state. As recently as 2017, Amnesty International estimated there were around 200,000 political prisoners being held in camps all across the country, who are often subjected to slave labor, torture, and summary executions. Not to even mention all of the other prisoners in the country for non-political related crimes. One can be sentenced to a life in prison in North Korea for merely being related to someone who actually committed a crime. Such as an infamous case that only recently came to light by way of the US State Department of a two-year-old child who was sentenced to life in prison back in 2009 after his parents were caught by the authorities with a Bible in their possession, a piece of foreign contraband that had been illegally smuggled into the country. All foreign media and content from the outside world has been strictly outlawed within North Korea for decades, with various penalties being dealt out to anyone caught smuggling such content in, distributing it, or consuming it, up to and including life in prison and death. North Korea is one of only four countries remaining in the world that routinely carries out public execution of prisoners, with the only others being Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Somalia. It also has historically been extremely difficult for any foreigners to get permission to get into the country, and whenever they have been allowed in, they are permanently placed under intense levels of surveillance the entire time they are within, and only taken on highly curated tours where they are only shown what the regime wants to be shown. Sometimes foreigners who visit are even killed when they run astray of any number of the regime's arbitrary laws, like Otto Warmbier, an American man who was visiting North Korea as a tourist back in 2016, who was arrested after allegedly attempting to steal a propaganda poster from the wall of his hotel, a crime for which he was later sentenced to 15 years of hard labor in a prison camp. He was returned to the United States a little over a year later in a vegetative state with little explanation, and died only days later. As a result of all of this, North Korea has long been regarded as the most isolated and secretive country that exists in the contemporary world and the most difficult country to get anything or anyone into or out from. Escaping out of the country or smuggling illicit material into the country has always been difficult for a wide variety of reasons, but it all starts with North Korea's rather unique geography. For many decades, the Kim dynasty in the country have worked tirelessly to essentially transform North Korea into a de facto island, completely separated and removed from the rest of the outside world their east and their west, this was already granted by geography in the form of the Sea of Japan and the Yellow Sea. Escaping out of the country across either of these seas is incredibly challenging, because boats are very hard to come by within the country, and the North Korean Navy maintains routine patrols all along the coasts, especially near to North Korea's southernmost territories next door to South Korea. South Korea itself, obviously, is the number one location the North Korean defectors attempt their escapes to, mostly because not only is South Korea a vast wealthier and more developed country, but the South Korean government also officially considers that all of the native Koreans of the entire Korean peninsula are her own citizens, including all of North Korea's 25 million residents. Any North Korean who can make their way into South Korea is automatically considered a South Korean citizen, and that alone provides an enormous incentive to leave. Of all the North Korean defectors who have successfully made it out of the country since the 1990s, 34,000 of them have found their way down to South Korea, compared to only around 1,000 in Europe and only around 200 in the United States. But getting to South Korea directly has almost always been impossible because of the existence of the Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, that runs across the entire length of the southern border from coast to coast. Contrary to how its name appears, this is the most heavily militarized border anywhere in the world, through which hardly anything at all is ever allowed to pass. There are tens of thousands of troops on both sides who directly patrol the numerous lines of walls, fortifications,
fortifications and barbed wire in addition to around 2 million landmines. The North Korean Border Patrol has orders to shoot anyone who attempts to cross. There are 750,000 North Korean soldiers deployed within 100 kilometers of the border in the north, and another 450,000 South Korean soldiers, plus 20,000 American soldiers deployed within 100 kilometers of the border to the south. Breaking through this extremely imposing obstacle to get directly into South Korea has always been very dangerous and risky, which is why very few have ever successfully managed to do it. Historically, the comparatively easier but still extremely difficult path to escape out of North Korea was by attempting a run across the northern border into either China or Russia. At the same time, this was also historically the easiest border to smuggle illicit contraband into North Korea from as well. You see, North Korea maintains an official military alliance with China, and while relations have often still been strained between the two, they are nothing like the outright hostility seen on North Korea's southern border. As a result, there is little need for North Korea to keep hundreds of thousands of soldiers deployed here, because the risk of an invasion coming from China is fairly minimal. Simultaneously, North Korea's border with Russia is very tiny, at only about 17 kilometers, and North Korea's relations with Russia are also similarly warm, so there's never really been a big need to park soldiers along the small border here to deter a potential Russian invasion. Moreover, the North Korean border with China is massive. It stretches and winds for more than 1,300 kilometers as it generally follows the Yalu and Tumen rivers, through rugged mountains and forests that are mostly very sparsely populated. Thus, for most of North Korea's history, this long border in the north with China has been lightly patrolled and guarded, and so it has been fairly porous and relatively easy to smuggle both goods and people across. This was especially true during the winter months when the Yalu and Tumen rivers freeze over, enabling defectors and smugglers alike to simply walk across them, or during the summer months when the river's depths are at their lowest, enabling defectors and smugglers to just easily wade across them. But the biggest problem with this route for defectors was that once they crossed the border into either China or Russia, they still weren't exactly safe. Both Russia and China have extradition agreements in place with the North Korean government, meaning that any North Korean defectors they catch will be treated as illegal immigrants rather than as refugees, and deported back to North Korea, where they will face immediate imprisonment and potentially even execution. That's why for nearly every defector who did escape across the border into China or Russia, the goal wasn't to stay there, but to eventually make their way into a neighboring safe country, which there are precious few of. Myanmar and Laos were always out because, just like China and Russia, they will immediately deport any North Korean defector they catch in their territories right back to North Korea. For the most part, that only left Mongolia, Thailand, or Vietnam as nearby safe countries the defectors could flee towards because, since South Korea considers all North Koreans to be their own citizens as well, these three countries will deport any North Korean defectors they catch to South Korea instead. So the plan for defectors was to always cross the porous mountainous border into China, and then, eventually, gradually, make their ways to Mongolia, Thailand, or Vietnam where they would then immediately surrender to the local authorities there and get deported on a plane to safety and a new life in South Korea. Defections out of North Korea only truly began a spike, however, in the 1990s after the Soviet Union collapsed at the end of 1991, which had been the primary financial supporter of the North Korean regime. Then, with its primary financial benefactor and supporter gone, and heavy financial sanctions placed upon it by the United States, Japan, and South Korea, North Korea suddenly found its economy and agriculture unsustainable. With very little money and hardly any ability to import farming equipment or fertilizer, with food imports from the Soviet Union gone, with exacerbating droughts and floods, and with a base of less than 20% of their land even being considered arable in the first place, North Korea couldn't acquire enough food to sustain its entire population. And the worst famine in the country's entire history followed. Because of the North Korean government's incredible levels of secrecy, nobody really knows exactly how bad the famine during the 1990s was. But estimates range from about 300,000 deaths on the lower end to as many as 3.5 million on the higher end across only four years between 1994 and 1998. With masses of people desperate to escape from the famine, defections out of North Korea consequently began to spike. And, sensing an opportunity to make some money, a class of entrepreneurial smugglers in North Korea arose as well, who began smuggling in much-needed items like food and medicine, but also illicit contraband like Western and South Korean movies, TV shows, and books. 
By the early 2000s, thousands of North Koreans were successfully defecting out of the country every single year, and the vast majority of them were escaping across the northern border into China, making their way eventually to Thailand, Vietnam, or Mongolia, and getting themselves deported from there to South Korea. The number of defectors steadily continued increasing year after year long after the Great Famine had ended, until they reached a peak in 2009 when a total of 2,914 North Koreans successfully managed to find their ways down into South Korea. The largest number to ever defect in a single year since the conclusion of the Korean War back in the 1950s. Defections out of the country remained high in both 2010 and 2011, with over 2,000 taking place each of those years. But then, at the very end of 2011, something different happened. The man who had ruled North Korea as the supreme leader ever since 1994 suddenly died in December, and his son, Kim Jong-un, succeeded him. And ever since taking power back then at the end of 2011, Kim Jong-un has worked tirelessly to crack down on both defections and smuggling within his kingdom. Signal jammers began getting installed all across the northern frontiers and remote mountain passes to block out foreign cell and satellite signals. Intelligence monitoring of phone calls in the northern areas were increased, while more border fences were being built up and patrols increased. Simultaneously, things were changing in both Russia and China as well. In 2014, Russia signed an agreement with North Korea that they would begin deporting any defectors they caught in the country back, essentially eliminating Russia as a viable country for would-be defectors to escape into once and for all. Meanwhile, China began increasingly developing its own massive surveillance state apparatuses after the passing of the PRC cybersecurity law in 2016. Within just four years from then, by 2020, the Chinese had likely increased the number of their surveillance cameras operating all across the country to more than 620 million more than 12 times as many surveillance cameras operating across the United States, combined with increasingly rigorous monitoring of internet and cell services. Since China has always treated all North Korean defectors as illegal immigrants, these sweeping changes to surveillance in China made it far easier for the Chinese authorities to detect them in the country, while they were trying to make it across to the safer countries in Thailand, Vietnam, or Mongolia, and made their journeys significantly more dangerous and risky than they had ever been before. To compensate for the increased levels of risk that were developing, brokers and human traffickers within China who often helped North Korean defectors escape began charging more and more money to do so. Back in 2007, the average price that a broker in China would charge to help a North Korean defector escape to Thailand or Vietnam was around $2,000 a lot of money for the average North Korean, but still theoretically doable. But by 2012, shortly after Kim Jong-un took power, the price had doubled to around $4,000. By 2015, the price the brokers were charging had doubled again to about $8,000. And by 2017, the prices were anywhere between $13,000 and $16,000 per each defector. Because most North Koreans earn less than $2,000 a year, saving up those kinds of sums to escape would take them years or even decades of scraping by to do. So it became no longer realistic for most to hire a broker to help them, unless they already had family members who had escaped before them who could save up the money on their behalf with higher paying jobs in developed economies like South Korea. Thus, at some point in the 2010s, there became a point where the overwhelming majority of North Koreans could only escape the country if they chose to do so completely on their own, without any help from the outside, which would require them to travel on their own across the mountainous border in the north, and then somehow make it all the way through a massive country like China, with an unparalleled surveillance state, where they don't know the local language at all, in order to get towards a safe country like Mongolia, Thailand, or Vietnam, and never get caught by the police along the entire way. Good luck with that for most. As a result, the trend of people successfully escaping out of North Korea began dwindling downwards with every passing year after Kim Jong-un took power, as it became increasingly difficult for people to do so. By 2019, only a total of 1,047 North Koreans managed to get out of the country to South Korea. Less than half of the numbers that had gotten out back at the beginning of the decade in 2010 and 2011. And then, beginning in 2020, the ability to escape from North Korea became even more bleak than it had been before. In January of 2020, only two months after the very first reported case of COVID-19 was made in China back in November, North Korea became the very first country in the world to completely shut down and seal all of its borders, citing its desire to keep the virus out of the country at all costs. Basically, all travel into and out of the country was shut down, every international flight that North Korea had was immediately canceled, and nearly all foreign trade with the outside world was halted. And at first glance, it kind of makes sense why North Korea was so paranoid so early about the virus. 
This is a country where it is estimated that around 42% of the population are currently considered to be malnourished. One of the highest levels of malnutrition seen anywhere in the contemporary world, and of course, malnourished people are significantly more susceptible to the negative effects caused by COVID-19 than otherwise healthy people are. North Korea would only end up reporting its first confirmed case of the virus on the 12th of May 2022, and only three months later in August, the regime had already self-declared its victory over eradicating it from the country. With only a very minimal 74 officially reported COVID-related deaths. But the reality was almost certainly a lot worse than that. Anonymous inside doctors and sources reporting to the BBC this year claimed that about 1 in 550 people in Pyongyang actually died from COVID during that outbreak in 2022. If that source is accurate, which honestly, who knows, and if you extrapolated it out to the rest of the country, it would suggest a potential COVID-19 related death toll in North Korea of around 45,000 orders of magnitude worse than the officially reported number of only 74. Though I suggest that that should be heavily treated with a grain of salt. But regardless, the North Korean regime was almost certainly genuinely worried about COVID-19 getting into the country. But they also have clearly capitalized on the pandemic as an excuse to finally finish locking down North Korean society and fully isolating it from the rest of the outside world. In August of 2020, the regime established so-called buffer zones on their northern borders with China and Russia. While firm orders were given out to North Korean soldiers patrolling the borders to unconditionally shoot anybody on sight attempting to either enter or leave without permission. A shoot to kill order that evidently continues to remain in force more than three years later now today. Moreover, the North Korean regime seized on the excuse of protecting the country from COVID-19 to construct a series of vast new fortifications all across the borders with China and Russia. Satellite imagery has revealed hundreds of kilometers worth of newly constructed walls, fences, barbed wire, and guard posts being constructed all along North Korea's northern border since the pandemic began, all of which have seemingly sealed off nearly all of the historical mountain passes and routes the defectors and smugglers alike have taken into and out of the country for decades. The once porous northern border has since become mostly solid, and hardly anything or anyone is crossing it at all now. But building out these vast new fortifications in the north with strict shoot-to-kill orders is not the only way that the regime has been making it increasingly impossible for any of its 25 million remaining subjects to escape. Much harsher restrictions have also been put into place on domestic travel within the country, meaning the North Koreans need proper authorization and paperwork simply to travel from province to province. And if you get caught without them, it's straight to one of the country's many prison camps. In December of 2020, the North Korean regime passed a new law called the Reactionary Ideology and Culture Rejection Act which heavily criminalizes receiving any information or object from the outside world, and bans anyone from possessing a non-government sanctioned cell phone. Under this new law, smuggling and distributing foreign videos or books into the country can be punished by a public execution. Even simply being caught watching a foreign video or reading a foreign book can be punished with a 10-year prison sentence to hard labor under this new law. Historically, foreign films and shows like South Korean K-dramas or dubbed American movies were smuggled in from China across the northern border on micro SD cards and then sold and watched in secret. But evidently, since the new extremely harsh laws were passed at the end of 2020 and the northern border got much more heavily sealed, these smuggled foreign films and movies into the country have virtually stopped entirely. Moreover, defections out of the country have virtually ground to a halt since the pandemic began as well. In 2020, there were only a grand total of 229 successful defections out of the country to South Korea, a tenth of the amount that were seen only a decade previously. And then 2021 and 2022 saw even less, with only 63 and 67 successful defection attempts taking place throughout the entire years, the lowest levels ever seen in North Korea's entire history as a state since 1948. And so far this year in 2023, the trend is looking to be pretty similar as the entire first quarter between January and March, some of the best months to escape when the northern rivers are frozen over, only recorded a paltry 30 four successful defections taking place. All of this is in comparison to the thousands of successful defections that were taking place every single year back in the early 2000s and 2010s. 
North Korea, in effect, has become the largest and possibly most successful prison in all of human history since 2020. But it isn't just the new laws and the new border in the North they've built that is all contributing to this. In truth, they're all merely a component of Kim Jong-un's grand concept of transforming North Korea into a truly closed digital state wherein the digital realm, as well as the physical realm within North Korea, are each completely isolated and separated from the rest of the world. This has been a long-time project of the North Korean state in the making. The phones that you can get in North Korea, for example, work very differently than the phones you're used to. State-sanctioned phones from North Korean state-owned companies are the only ones that you can legally possess. They can't connect to the internet, and they can't make international phone calls outside of North Korea. Moreover, they have state-sanctioned software installed on them that cannot possibly be removed, and that disables all foreign files, apps, clips, and text or sound files that were not created on North Korea's own state-owned operating system, called Red Star. These North Korean phones will also continually and randomly take screenshots of messages and activity history that cannot possibly be deleted, and inspections of the phone are mandatory by the North Korean police. In essence, these phones are only usable within North Korea and can only be used in ways that the North Korean regime deems acceptable. But foreign-made phones from the outside world smuggled in across the northern border were always problematic to the Kim regime's desire for this truly closed-off digital state. Foreign-made phones could actually make calls to the outside world, and they could contain outside foreign-made files like videos, texts, and sound. They were big business for a few entrepreneurial smugglers, because using a foreign-made phone might be the only way that a family within North Korea could contact a relative of theirs who had attempted an escape previously. It might be the only way to have ever known if your relative was still alive or dead. Many North Korean families would thus save up enormous amounts of money to meet these smugglers for the chance at a phone call to the outside or a chance to view or read something from the outside but no longer. By slamming shut the border and increasing the harshness of its laws, the North Korean regime has probably destroyed this smuggling process that was undermining its closed digital state ambition once and for all. And as the risks for getting defectors out have increased, so have the prices that the brokers are charging to try and help. As of 2021, the average price the Chinese brokers were apparently charging had increased more than $21,000 per defector, a full 10 times increase in the price from as recently as only 2007. And after North Korea became extremely sealed off from the outside world in 2020, the regime also began refusing all of the North Korean defectors from being returned who had been caught across the border in China, officially citing fears that they might bring the COVID-19 virus back into the country with them. There may currently be as many as 1,000 North Korean defectors being held in prisons within China near to the border, waiting to be sent back to the Kim regime when they finally accept them, where they will almost all certainly be sent to prisons and or be executed. But there is no certainty right now as to how much longer North Korea will remain even more isolated than it had ever been before. It could all be the new normal state of affairs for the elusive regime, and those 1,000 defectors sitting in China may be trapped in a limbo for a very long time. And the 25 million people remaining within North Korea may as well from now on be basically stuck within a completely separate universe. The black hole on the world map that North Korea has become since 2020 has made it effectively impossible for nearly anyone within to get out, or for anything from outside to get in. Aided by North Korea his own unique geography and the Kim regime's own ruthless application of laws, fortifications, and new digital technology. Everything from the outside world is now thoroughly blocked within North Korea, as it has never been before. But it is also far from the only country that is placing restrictions on foreign media. American websites like Google, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Wikipedia, Reddit, and dozens of others have been blocked in China for years. But now, popular Chinese websites and apps like TikTok are beginning to be similarly blocked in the United States. Just last month in May of 2023, Montana became the first U.S. state to pass legislation banning TikTok everywhere on all personal devices for everyone within the state. A ban set to take effect in January of 2024 next year that'll block access to TikTok for all of the state's 1.1 million residents. Additional U.S. states could end up following Montana's decision, and there were many representatives and senators in the federal government who would like to see TikTok banned outright nationwide. 
The internet should be exactly the same no matter where you are, but that's simply not the case, even if you're living in a place like the United States, Europe, Canada, or Australia. Pretty much everywhere, there are an increasing number of censorship firewalls, legislation like in Montana limiting where you can access what, and different versions of websites with different prices depending on the country or state you're in. This is most apparent when it comes to booking flights, hotels, and holidays. Companies will use cookies to adapt their services offered to you, like increasing the prices for things when you return to their website in the hope that you'll impulsively make a purchase out of fear of the price rising once again. Sometimes, airlines and hotels will offer cheaper ticket prices to people in their home countries, while alternatively, they may also spike prices if interest from the same country suddenly increases all at once, like during specific holidays in the United States or UK that aren't holidays somewhere else. Companies will also adjust their prices based on the user's country because they assume that someone from a wealthier country like the US, UK, or Canada will be able to afford to pay higher prices. And this is where using a VPN like today's sponsor NordVPN can come in handy and literally save you hundreds in airfare tickets and holiday bookings. Once you're signed up for a subscription and installed the NordVPN app on your device and launched it, you can securely connect your device to a router in a different country and browse through holiday service providers and jot down their prices. Then you clean out your browser's cache to prevent those same services service providers from identifying you as a returning user, and then you connect to a different country server and check out the holiday service providers again and compare their prices. Here are three different examples showing three different holidays booked from the United States with the US prices shown in this column, and then the prices for the exact same holidays booked with a VPN through servers in Italy and the UK shown in this column worth hundreds of dollars in savings. This is my own favorite way to use a VPN to save money on trips and vacations, but they have tons of other uses and purposes as well. From circumventing website or app blockers like Montana's TikTok ban legislation, to entertainment benefits like being able to unlock the streaming libraries available in other countries, and so much more. And NordVPN gives you the best possible experience, which is why I use them and why I'd absolutely recommend you give them a try as well especially considering the incredible deal that they're offering right now. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, and for a limited time when you use my link, nordvpn.com slash reallifelore, any two-year plan you sign up for will also include extra subscription time, and you'll be greatly helping to support Real Life Lore while you're at it. So click the button here on screen right now or follow the link down below in the description to sign up. And as always, thank you so much for watching.